The scientific process has changed over the years. For scientists, professional advancement has always been tied to productivity. But these days, productivity is too often measured by the amount of money a scientist can gather for research. Scientists are thereby pressured on two fronts, from their employers who expect a continuing flow of grant money, and from grant-giving bodies who demand profitable results. Well, modern science is now being heavily funded by institutions, multinational corporations, and government agencies, and the competition and demand for funding is astonishing and just growing at an alarming rate. Uh, in this age of billion dollar atom smashers and multi-million dollar magnetic resonance imaging devices, the, the complexity and costs of research and maintaining the most up-to-date up technology are expanding at exponential rates. Uh, not at all like the old days of Charles Darwin or Isaac Newton. Uh, no money, no research, I'm afraid. Now, even the largest of institutional grants cannot satisfy the ever-expanding appetite for research dollars. Sometimes the money is set aside solely for universities, sometimes it's set aside solely for business, sometimes solely for government laboratories, sometimes anybody can go after it. And so we write proposals to government agencies. Um, we're usually in competition with all these other organizations. Uh, the win rate right now is somewhere between 5% and 8% of the proposals that are turned in actually get funded. Wonder about whether or not they have to fly. Seasoned scientists find themselves going up against much younger, comparatively inexperienced challengers, each competing for finite funds in a glutted field. This competition for grants, status, and position makes the temptation to veer off the path difficult to resist. Uh, right now, uh, I'm looking for a job uh, just uh, because the, we are running out of the grant and chances of getting the grant is highly competitive. Many a livelihood is dependent upon the procurement of grant funding. Scientists fortunate enough to win this coveted cash find themselves hamstrung by the prerequisites of their patrons. Relationships develop which many consider unhealthy. Anytime a company like Pfizer funds a researcher, there is usually a contracting that goes on between the two as to where the restrictions are, what the specific outcomes are. Is there an expected outcome for the investment? Yes, there would be. But you're talking about hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of hours investment in bringing any single product to marketplace. With such extraordinary amounts of money at stake, grant recipients are subjected to such microscopic scrutiny by their benefactors that the possibility of failure can barely be entertained. Obviously, with the prospects of billions of dollars uh, of, of profit at stake with the, the development of, of a new drug or new technology, uh, grant recipients are subjected to massive scrutiny uh, by their patrons and supporters. Uh, I've always felt that this kind of relationship uh, between sponsor and researcher inevitably leads to uh, major conflicts of interest. Scientists, those honorable, distinguished people who diligently focus on solving the most complicated of problems, selflessly throwing themselves at the inequities of a savage world. Now we see that at least those in the private sector, those working for corporations, for instance, are subject to the same ethical dilemmas we are all forced to face. But how about those unimpeachable professors, the men and women covered by the security blanket of university life? How do they fare in all of this? The individual who is, be, who is able to attract grant funding, and particularly grant funding repetitively, uh, is, is viewed as being someone who is desirable to retain on one's faculty and certainly uh, to promote. Just one of the many examples I can think of is that of a research at the University of Paris who came up with absolutely outrageous claims of a, a homeopathic medicine that was discovered to be bogus by my colleague at the National Institutes of Health it was little surprised to find out that this researcher was funded by a homeopathic medicine manufacturing company. These university scientists are very independent and very rigorous in their approach to science and quite frankly are not as profit driven and therefore uh, basically will uh, analyze data in an appropriate manner and they will not be biased just because they have a uh, 
certain amount of grant support from a pharmaceutical firm. The f industry being involved in university research is a double-edged sword. There is the fear that there will be some uh, interjection of their uh, agenda into the research. Are they somewhat restricted in that they can't say they're going to do research on ABC and then decide to do research on XYZ without the involvement and the approval of the person funding it, sure, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. Given this environment, does the potential for objective scientific research really exist? What incentive is there for a scientist to research a lackluster group of findings if these will only result in his being passed over the next time deep-pocketed corporations come courting? It should come as no surprise then that many scientific researchers are becoming less concerned about whether data is contaminated, considering instead what can be done with contaminated data. Because if there's anywhere that science could be more corrupt, it would be in the, it, within the company itself, because there, those scientists are really profit motivated. Despite these consequences, the lure of short-term gain through fudged research is undeniable and, once indulged, becomes science fraud. Although incidents of science fraud have increased in recent years, this is not a new problem. Some of the biggest names in history have pulled off some of the biggest scams. It is widely known, for example, that Isaac Newton, father of modern physics, intentionally skewed data to make the work of a rival appear less important. Since his competitor's philosophy clashed with his own theory of universal gravitation, Newton improved some of his calculations on the velocity of sound and precision of the equinoxes to overshadow and malign the work of his challenger. The 19th century monk Abbey Gregor Mendel founded modern gene theory through the breeding and crossbreeding of pea plants. His results were so suspiciously perfect, however, that they prompted a later investigation which revealed that Mendel had tailored his data to help justify his theories.